Welcome to the SelfGrowth.com show. My name is David Ricklin, and I'm the founder of SelfGrowth.com. Today, we'll be discussing how to stop arguing in relationships and be happy again. To help us understand this topic, I'm excited to interview Ragini Michaels. Make sure to listen closely. We're going to be sharing a lot of information today. And I know there's a lot of issues around arguing in relationships, so we're going to go deep with some of this. Before we get started, I want to take a couple of minutes and share some information about Ragini. Uh, she's been an internationally acclaimed and certified NLP trainer since 1988, quite a few years. Her expertise in neurolinguistic programming and Ericksonian hypnosis resulted in a reputation for fast and effective behavioral change, as well as integrity and humor. For over four decades, she's run a successful private practice maintained exclusively by referrals from clients. She's also an Amazon.com best-selling author and long-term explorer of meditation, mindfulness, and spiritual inquiry, and how to integrate your inner and outer journeys. She's going to share with us practical wisdom that she's garnered from her 26 years in two personal relationships, as well as insights and applications from her years as a business owner working with assistants and consultants. She's also created a comprehensive program that's designed to help you create more loving, peaceful, and kind relationships at home, at work, and, in, and with yourself. And you can get more information. Jot this down for now, but we'll get back to it. The website is endarguing.com. So it's endarguing.com, but we'll get back to it a little bit later. Uh, Ragini, welcome to our show. Thank you, David. I am very honored to be here. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, we're going to jump right in over here. Okay. We're going to start with the common issues. So what are some of the common issues almost all couples argue about? <laughs> well, all I have to do is look at my own relationships, and I can tell you right off the bat. Uh, I would say money is one of the primary things that people sure. argue about. Uh, sex is another high one on the list. Um, an interesting one are the idiosyncrasies that we each have that sometimes can drive you crazy. Like, for example, your partner might eat their food with their fork or knife in a, in a hand that just drives you crazy or they hold right. it in a funny way, you know, things like that. So people fight over those kind of things. Um, generally, we can fight over the past. We argue about whose memory of the past is correct. We can argue about the future, which one is the more, you know, appropriate to be going for so you can have a clash of values. Uh, we can argue about who to blame for a certain circumstance or situation, which is happening a lot in politics these days. And we can also find ourselves arguing actually about almost nothing of any importance right. whatsoever. Like the cracker crumb you find on the floor can become, you know, the, the beginning of a huge argument if you're not careful. So we can argue about almost anything <laughs> and it, do. It, it seems that way. And I've been there as well. And what I'm seeing as well in terms of arguing is that there's so much public arguing also it's just it's become part of our culture now this it's it not only you know in a, a local in the privacy of your own that people are just arguing everywhere they don't have a qualms with arguing in public there's public arguing in terms of you know people are celebrities it's it's constant it's it's become a part of our society in, in a sense it has indeed, and it's, a, it's from my point of view, a, a real waste of our time and energy and taking us in the wrong direction because one of the reasons I'm happy to talk to the people in your program is because they're already interested in becoming more mindful and present right. and aware in daily life, which is kind of a precursor to actually wanting to put in the energy and the time to learn how to stop arguing in relationships. And uh, in relationship is life. So you're always in sure. relationship to something, right? Yes. So once you can learn how to uh, actually use your mindfulness and your presence and your awareness in a way that supports you to create more peaceful, kind, loving relationships wherever you go, whether it's to the, you know, the person at the Starbucks store or, you know, the clerk mm -hmm. at the QFC or whatever, you know, sure. or somebody who's got the totally opposite political view. Because right. you know, most of us are like, ah, whichever side you're on, you know, it doesn't sure. really matter which side you're on, you're, you're ready to dive into an argument. So um, I'm happy to talk to your people here and share some of what I've discovered about how to actually stop the argument. And of course, the place it has to stop is inside of your own being. So what I would like to share is some of those tips and things that you can do. All right. Sounds good. We'll get back to that in a little bit because I want to delve into some tips, but I have some general questions about arguing. You know, 
is there value in arguing? You know, the, are there certain situations where there is a value in, in real arguing? Well, there is a value in arguing. Now, if you can change, if you can tap it down from an argument to a disagreement, you're going to get a more positive outcome. So that's the first thing I want to say about arguing. <laughs> but um, there are things that can benefit you from expressing your opinions in a way that is um, a little bit more kind and useful than mm -hmm. we normally call arguing, which is usually right. screaming and yelling and saying, you're wrong and I'm right kind of thing. So um, yeah, it, it, when you argue or you know uh, communicate what you feel, you, you can communicate your needs via arguing. You can express your emotions via arguing. Arguing. You can actually, if you're in a relationship where there is no arguing, arguing can actually help save your marriage or the relationship because it starts to stir things up and make it more real. So it has a value to that. It can help you get to the real issue um, at hand. Arguing can do that. Again, it's how you argue. It's how Very you right. disagree mm -hmm. that can reveal that can really make it valuable for you. But there's a lot of things that can happen. I mean, as I say, it can prevent divorce. Um, and I think most of all, it can help you understand the other person's perspective or intention if you're able to listen for that when you're in the midst of an argument. So, okay. yeah, there's good rules for arguing. Mm -hmm. And I say the first one is to tap it back, you know, so that you're not actually arguing. <laughs> right. I like the concept of going from arguing to disagreeing. Because mm -hmm. my, my general sense is, and we'll get into it in more depth, sometimes when you're arguing, you're just, you're not listening at all. Right. And, and we'll get back into that. But one of the things I see in, in, with arguing is that people put such energy. You know, why do we argue with such energy? You know, like it's every fiber of their being. Why, why does that happen? Well, it's curious, you know, with my background in psychology and my own experience with it, I was really curious why. And being a person of an NLP and an Ericksonian background, I deal a lot with the unconscious mind. Mm -hmm. And what eventually became clear is that being wrong is a very dangerous experience for the unconscious mind, okay? It's actual danger because it somehow reveals that you're, the unconscious mind sees it as weak and vulnerable right. to be wrong. And what's curious is sometimes I believe that that can be rooted in our very first experiences as a child where we are in fact totally vulnerable, totally helpless, and totally dependent on other people. So how do we get their attention? M most babies start crying, you know, yelling, right. <laughs> screaming, mm -hmm. sure. you know? And, and in, in a way, we learn that if we can make a lot of noise, if we can be demanding, we can get what we need because we believe that we don't have it inside of us, what we need in order right. to answer our questions and fulfill those desires. So I think it has a real root in our just being a human being, but it does live as a very alive, unconscious belief mm -hmm. that if I'm wrong, somehow I'm vulnerable, I'm weak, right. I'm in danger, my security, my safety is actually being challenged. You know, I have to fight for this. And I, right. that's just I get not getting upset, but actually taking action which is like the argument, I am mm -hmm. right, you are wrong kind of thing. So it's very strong, I agree with you. It's when you're in an argument and you're in the grips of it, it's about survival for your unconscious mind. That is an interesting perspective and it, it really speaks to why people put such energy, they're so tied, they're so desperately tied to their point of view. Yes. I think this is what happens and it said, uh, I like what you're saying that the fact that people feel vulnerable if they're wrong, mm -hmm. and this this enables them to to kind of fight against that vulnerability. It absolutely does, and human beings have a lot of defense mechanisms that are natural, naturally set up as we grow up, and most of those are to defend and protect our security. And mm -hmm. believe, and it's just amazing how being wrong has become such a big one for us in right. our society as well. You've got to be right in order to succeed, right. in order to be acceptable, you know, it just goes on and on at it. Sure. Yeah. I see that yeah. a lot. So I want to talk a little bit about mistakes for relationships. Couples are an important relationship. So mm -hmm. what, what are some of the biggest mistakes or what's the biggest mistake most couples make in their relationship? Well, I can certainly tell you the one I made it for 26 years, <laughs> which in two relationships, which was really expecting my partner to make me happy and then blaming him for failing. 
<laughs> and that I think is the biggest mistake we make because expectations are something that we all have. You know, right. there's no way you're going to be in life and not have an expectation. There are a lot of good things to it. One of the bad things about it is when you expect your expectation to be filled by someone else as opposed to yourself. And happiness is a core expectation that we all have. And most of us hand our personal power over to our partners in that circumstance and say, now you have to make me happy by doing this for me. I have the right to ask for this. I have the right to expect right. you to do it for me, right? And then um, you're not, it's not okay for you to not be willing to do that because I take that sort of as a personal affront. Mm -hmm. You know, my value is not being honored. So, so we have it all skewed up in a funny way you know, that, that somehow it's their job. And if they don't do it, I'm right because I have the right to ask and they're wrong for not mm -hmm. feeling right. And that's just a great foundation battlefield for arguing. <laughs> I think that's a pretty common view also that, you know, if you have a partner that their role is to make sure you're happy. And, and in truth, you can't really give someone for, well, first it sounds like what you're saying, and I agree, you're just giving someone all this power yeah, yeah. In, in terms of they have the power to determine whether or not you're happy. Yeah. And that's like crazy. <laughs> that's a lot of power to give up. Give and it's up. something that you really can't, you know, as much as you might want to give it up, my view, I think I agree with you is that you can't give it up, that you have to be responsible for your own happiness. You do. I mean, that's really where it lies is on the inside. And once I think you get that. And once I got that insight that I was making, I was the one who was making me unhappy in my relationship, not my partner. Right. Then I could take my power back and start looking at, you know, using my mindfulness, my presence, my spiritual inquiry to start finding out, well, where am I looking at this incorrectly? Where is my perception, you know, kind of tweaked or distorted in some way? And then I think we have a chance then to come back and realize that, you know, it, when connection is the higher value, it becomes mm -hmm. easier to do that. Right. To step back and, and take your power back because you it's, it's kind of a funny paradox, because in order to connect, you actually have to separate in some way. <laughs> no, that, uh, I completely understand that paradox. Yes. So, yeah. Let me talk about another area kind of compromise. So one of the challenges that I see and I've been there myself in terms of arguing is that people aren't willing to compromise. And I know you say that we misunderstand compromise. And what do you mean when you say that? Well, my experience was very much, and this is for myself and also working with people over four decades, uh, compromise is usually seen as having to give something up in order to get along with someone. Right. So the, the, the way to look at that in a new way is to understand that both your partner's viewpoint and your viewpoint have strengths and they also have weaknesses because you're standing in different places. You know, when I was in with one of my relationships, we used to have an ongoing big argument about the proper way to slice an onion. Now, this was really ridiculous <laughs> in every possible way. It made no sense, but yet it was a real thing in the kitchen, the proper way to solve, you know, to chop an onion. So we finally came to the, to the uh, we each had a reason why chopping it th this way was better than chopping it that right. way. And they were both valid, you know, but they were both incomplete because there was no one right way to chop an onion. It came out that there were two right ways to chop an onion, depending on where you were standing in relationship to the outcome, you know, or the pot that was on the stove cooking, right? <laughs> so we agreed, this was really one of the fun things that we did. We agreed that one day that we cooked, we chopped the onions his way. And the next time we cooked, we chopped the onions my way. And they would get to be right all day long on the day that it was their way to chop the onion. Right. And I learned how how to be okay with being wrong, right? Because it felt that way. And I had to really stretch myself out to make connection and getting along with my partner more important than the right way to cut the onion being what actually happened. <laughs> so it, okay, it has a lot it. to do, yeah, it has a lot to do with understanding that all viewpoints are actually valid because they're seen from a certain point, you know, mm -hmm. but they're also always incomplete. And so you can always have two right views. You know, and that really starts to make a difference. It kind of cuts in to uh, the the way you're looking at compromise. And again, if you can put um, if you can put connection and creating, you're putting your power into creating this positive and loving and kind relationship, then it's easier to let go because you go, oh, there's actually 
two ways to cut an onion and they're both just fine, you know, and they, they have strengths, they have weaknesses. And so you come out of the compromise with a bigger sense of connection, right? And, and that you're not losing anything, you're actually gaining something. Uh, that makes total sense. But it, as a starting point, you have to be willing to understand that there's, there could be more than one way. Yes, you have to be Conceptually, willing. Conceptually, you have to understand that there, there possibility for more than one way. Absolutely. And you know, it's funny because if you make a circle and you put whatever it is you're focusing on in the center of it, you know, there are 360 degrees around that circle. So in uh -huh. actuality, there are 360 different ways that that middle point is going to look to people. Right. So, and you wonder, they're all valid because if you, you know that old saying, if you stand in your, in your neighbor's shoes, you'll know exactly what they're feeling. But the thing that's really important as well as that is to understanding that all viewpoints are incomplete. They're valid, but they're incomplete. Right. That's kind of the real thing that makes you more able to step back and say, okay, this is, oh, this is good. We'll do it this way. We'll compromise. So that's almost a starting point to understand that all our viewpoints are incomplete because they're only coming from our vantage point. Right. There is no, that's a perfect way to say it. I, sh I wanted to say it that way, but I didn't. <laughs> Next, <laughs> that time. Good. Next time. <laughs> so in terms of disagreeing, so as part of this process, you're disagreeing with whether it's your partner, your friend, business associate, is there a correct way to disagree with someone? In yeah. my opinion, the best way to disagree is to disagree without being disagreeable. <laughs> Okay, and so what do you mean by that? Way, the only way you can really do that is to be in the place that we were just talking about, where you know that your vantage point is valid and so is theirs, and they're both incomplete. So when you can do that, when you have that way of looking at it, then you can step back a little bit with your mindfulness and your presence, you know, use that part of yourself, bring it into that circumstance, and then you can actually, even if you're speaking to someone who's on the opposite view politically, right? You can find yourself able to disagree without being disagreeable, right? Because there are, there are positive aspects to every viewpoint and there are negative aspects to every viewpoint because they are incomplete. So it has to sense. be that way. Yeah. So, so I think is when you, when you learn how to do this and you can step back and use your, you know, your, all these years you've put into practicing mindfulness and meditation and take a breath, step back and, you know, just put yourself in the place where you can actually disagree. You don't have to give up your opinion. You don't have to feel right or wrong. It's just a different viewpoint. Right. And that makes it easier to be, um, agreeable when you're disagreeing. I, I like that perspective a lot. So yeah. let's, it's a good goal. <laughs> we're going to jump into another area. I know one of the things you teach is that uh, you need to be willing to be wrong, that being willing to be wrong is kind of the key that can stop arguing and open the doors to real communication. Can you explain what you mean by that? Well, I mean that whenever you can let go of the idea that you have to be right, which is no easy task, you know, it's hard. First, you have to be aware that you want to be, that you actually are demanding to be right. But whenever you remember there is a possibility of two right ways to view this circumstance, and they both have strengths and they both have weaknesses, then what, you, what happens is you say, okay, I can be willing to be wrong, which opens the door for communication. Now, when you understand that being willing to be wrong does not equal being wrong, it does right. not. And that's where people get hooked. They think if I'm willing to be wrong, it means I'm wrong. No, you can keep your viewpoint. You can keep your perspective. You can stand up for it. You can you know, give reasons why it's good. But it also allows you then to understand that your viewpoint has some weaknesses as well. right? And that the other viewpoint has some strengths that you weren't possibly looking at or being able to see before. So when you're willing to be wrong, once you get that it doesn't mean you're wrong because your unconscious mind will go, no, 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 you can't be wrong. That's dangerous, dangerous. So just willing to be wrong means you're open. You're willing to explore with your partner or mm -hmm. whoever you're talking about what the differences are and the perspectives and how it's possible that there are benefits and weaknesses to both of the viewpoints. And maybe we can find a way to work with both of them. So each person gets the benefits of that, that they wish and um, also honors that there are weaknesses. And that's usually where the strength of the other viewpoint comes in. But you can't find any of that if you're not willing to be wrong. Right, that makes sense. I, I get how I've been sometimes in the future. You just, you get so attached 
and obsessed with being right that it doesn't even matter what your viewpoint is or what you're arguing about. You just sometimes just get so attached to being right that you'll you'll just keep pushing because you don't care whether you're happy or unhappy. You don't care about anything else, what the loss is. All you're really attached sometimes is, is just being right. Yes, absolutely. And I agree totally. And that takes us back to this is a matter of life and death for your unconscious mind. This right. is about safety and security. And so when you can cut into that with your awareness and realize this is not you fighting for, for this perspective, this is your unconscious mind in defense mode right? It's created the battlefield and it's walked out onto it, armed to the teeth, you know? And so again, mindfulness, presence, awareness applied mm -hmm. to, right. the, to, to understanding that being right is not that big a deal. I mean, actually the benefits of being right, I found were pretty minimal, you know? They, I mean, yeah, I felt good in the moment because sure. my expectation that I was a smart person and I was right. brighter than the other person or whatever got fulfilled and you know fulfilled expectations are tantalizingly addictive sure. <laughs> you, know, you like them <laughs> so it's hard to break the attachment I totally I totally agree it's a really good point that's all it is sometimes but it's helpful to remember it's oftentimes the unconscious mind that mm -hmm. is now in protective mode and it thinks survival is the issue and you know when you take a step back you see it's not Mm -hmm. I mean, how important is it how you cut an onion, right? right. <laughs> you could probably live your whole life and not cut the onion your way. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You can, so you anyway, can just let a, that go. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Letting it go is, you know, back to surrender is one of the best ways. But in this instance, you have to be willing to be to be wrong. And that's the way you get to mm -hmm. the place where you can have the disagreement without being disagreeable. All right. So one of the things we touched on earlier is kind of happiness and your having responsibility for your own happiness. So why do you say, I know you say that happiness in a relationship is best left in your own hands. What do you, what do you mean by that? And why is that so important? Well, it's important because of what you mentioned earlier. This is a, this is power. This is your power to use in whatever way you want. You're the one who creates the way you experience your life. Right. So if that if, if you're unhappy with the way you're experiencing your relationship, it's more than likely because you've given your power away to create mm -hmm. that relationship to somebody else's uh, willingness to fill your needs. Right. And that's that's going down the wrong path. So when you keep your happiness in your own hands and you've got it right there and you've got some ways to 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 stop yourself from giving it away all the time, which is usually about being right, curiously mm -hmm. enough. Uh, then you can find that you're going to be happier even when your partner does that disgusting idiosyncrasy that you hate watching over dinner <laughs> or you're talking to somebody of the opposite political viewpoint. You right. know, it's a, it's a great thing to watch yourself in the political thing, which is so big right now, to be able to listen to somebody who has a, the opposite viewpoint and feel yourself wanting to argue but being willing to be wrong because you can see the value of both viewpoints and the weaknesses of both. So when you can do that, then you can be happy no matter what's going on because you're in charge of how you're looking at it, how you're perceiving it. And that is real personal freedom. Right. That means you're free to re I use your power in your own way and be free to feel happy mm -hmm. and calm no matter what's going on outside of you. That makes, makes total sense. Yeah. So I want to spend some time, I mentioned earlier that you've created this comprehensive program on how to stop arguing in relationships. And I know we've touched on some concepts here, but we don't have time to really go fully deep into this, a lot of steps and, and things and approaches people can take. Uh, can you share with us some more information about your program? And mm -hmm. I just, I'll give out the URL for folks one more time. The website is endarguing.com. And can you share with us some of the details, what do you go into with the program? How does it work for folks? And, and, and really, and who's it for? Okay. Um, well, it's for anyone who argues all the time. This is not for people who have anger management issues. All right. You need to see somebody to work with you if you really have difficulty with anger. Mm -hmm. It's also not that useful for people who are in a 
um, uh, a relationship that's not safe in an, any kind of abusive circumstance. So you don't, if you're in the, either of those two categories, this is not going to be for you. Right. But if you're a pretty normal person who's in relationship or not in relationship with a partner, but with friends, with the country, you know, with, mm -hmm. with, with your colleagues at work or whatever, or your clients, um, then this course will be valuable for you. It's composed of eight lessons and they are mm. written lessons um, each one sort of takes you down a different little path the ones we've been talking about here today mm -hmm. um, you know why why we're so attached to being right why we're so unwilling to be wrong you know sure. uh, why we have such intensity in, when we anger you know and that's talking about all the defense mechanisms in the course that you can identify all of the eight lessons have um, action steps that go with it and tips that go with it. And there's also, I believe, I think there's four little animated videos that uh -huh. makes it a little more fun. And there are also four hypnosis meditation MP3s that I have done as well. And it comes from my series called um, Hypnosis um, to Heal the Heart and Soul. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was trying to remember them. Okay. So that is included in the program as well. And I believe those are also downloadable. So you can put them on your, you know, thing and listen to it when you're doing something else besides sitting at the computer. Right. But the, and the intent of it is to all, not just give you the intellectual understanding, but to start to work with your unconscious mind as well and start to loosen up some of the, the beliefs that it has that this thing is actually about life and death. Right. Because once you can get the unconscious mind to understand this is not a life and death circumstance, mm -hmm. you know, and that's why I took those other ones out uh, for the average individual. It's just something that you have to work with and bring more into your awareness. So the course is designed to help you do that. Again, action steps and tips are with each of the eight lessons. Um, if you if you wish to have uh, interaction with me personally live, the course, uh, you can take a second option on the course and have three 30 minute private sessions with me while you go through the course. The eight lessons are delivered every one every third day, giving you a time to play with some of the action steps and work mm -hmm. with some of the tips and see if you have something that's coming up. And then if you choose to take that option with me, we can talk about that and work with it in the one-on-one -on -one work that goes with the courses should you decide you want that. Otherwise it's, you know, it's just the regular thing without me alive involved. So if you're one of the people and I've been this way as well, uh, that arguing is kind of part of your life and you want to really figure out how to, how to overcome and kind of reduce the argument, take a look at her program, check it out and arguing.com and scroll down a little bit. You'll see all the details as you scroll down. But everything's there. It steps you through everything's in the program. And it's really a way to get a handle on, on this. And I know we, we kind of live in this culture and it's almost become part of who we are. But we need to, to learn to step back from that. And Rogany helps you do that in endarguing.com. Right, and I know we've covered a lot of information today. Uh, and you go a lot deeper into the program. We only have a, another couple of minutes. Any final words for our audience today? Well, I would say that this audience that you have are people dedicated to personal growth and personal evolution. So most people in your audience probably have a, um, a practice of some kind to develop mindfulness presence, uh, whether, it's, whether it's prayer or contemplation or meditation. That's the foundation for having a happier life because it gives you, and you already know this, but I'm just verifying mm -hmm. it as well, sure. you know, that somebody who's been doing it for like almost 50 years, um, it, you know, that's what allows you to step back and get this much distance from your mind. You only mm -hmm. need that much diff distance to connect with that other part of you that's been pulling you to evolve, whatever that is. That's not your mind. That's your heart and soul. That's the very right. essence of who you are. That's what we want to follow. And we can't find it in the midst of an argument. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone, right? It's not gone, but we lose access to it. So whatever you're doing in relationship to building that, those capacities within yourself, fabulous, because there's no other way to really get ahead and to, to, to step back from your mind and move closer to your heart and soul than to develop the ability to be aware that you are in your mind and it is in charge and taking right. the lead. And you have to say, stop. No, we're not going that way. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times in a day I say to my mind, nope, I'm sorry, not going down that path. Well-worn. I know what's at the end of it. No way we're going this way. <laughs> I like it. 
Yeah. So whatever you guys are doing in terms of developing your presence, your mindfulness, your ability to be here and now, that's the perfect thing. And then you can really get juice out of this course because you'll All know right. how to implement it more quickly and more effectively. All right. That's a good message. So thank you once again for joining us today. Thank you for having me, David. It's been fun. You're welcome. And I want to thank everybody for listening. And I wish everybody great success in all areas of your life. We'll talk to everybody soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.